Good afternoon. I'm Gary Getson, board chair of the Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center. Our mission is to celebrate the culture and heritage of Muskoka. We're telling the Muskoka story as a microcosm of Canada, a case study, if you will, of what's happened in other regions of our country. We are promoting a new and higher level of respect and understanding of all peoples, including the indigenous cultures dating back many millennia. We can't do this alone. And this webinar series is a result formed of formed partnerships and relationships over many years. This series was inspired by Dr. Norman Yan, a founding member of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, and Gara Bagaron Thompson of Wata First Nation, who led us to the Indigenous thought leaders on the subject of natural law. We're pleased to present, together with the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, the best of two worlds, lessons for the sustainability from Indigenous ecological knowledge and Western science. So now I am pleased to turn it over to our president, John Miller. John, over to you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is John Miller, president of Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center. And uh, I, like Gary, would like to welcome you to our webinar, The Best of Two Worlds. We would like to acknowledge the First Peoples who for thousands of years before us, were and are still the keepers and caretakers of this land where we now live and work. We're dedicated to honoring the indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. In particular for Muskoka, all four cultures, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat and Métis that inhabited these lands either currently or historically. We recognize all the generations of indigenous people and their historic connection to this place. And we are grateful for the opportunity to gather here at this time. So this webinar is a five episode series, and it's a collaboration between Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center and the Friends of Muskoka Watershed, where we discuss sustainability with an indigenous perspective. Together, we discover how indigenous practices and Western science can contribute to a healthier planet, meet thoughtful Western and indigenous environmental prof professionals, and listen to their different approaches to stewardship of the environment based on their years of engagement in ecological management in the case of indigenous ways, thousands of years. By gaining a better understanding of the two approaches, we can improve the potential for a more sustainable future. I'd like to introduce two members of our team. Uh, Jordan Waynes, our assistant general manager for the steamships is in charge of the technical aspects of the webinar and is behind the scenes. And Ann Curley, our operations manager for the Discovery Center will be running the Q and A at the conclusion of the presentation. You, the audience, are encouraged to pose questions in our chat function during the webinar, and then we'll read them to our presenter. If your question has already been posted, then click like beside it, and it'll be moved higher up in the priority. We can't answer all the questions in the time allowed, unfortunately. So uh, please email, if you, if you wish, please email a question to us in the address that Jordan posts in the chat, and we'll work on getting those answers to you. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Norman Yan. Dr. Yan is a senior research scholar for York University and a director of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed. First with the Ontario government, then with York University, and finally with the Friends of Muskoka Watershed, Norman Yan has devoted half a century of work to understanding human impacts on Ontario's lakes and how to fix the damage from multiple stressors, including acid rain, smelter pollution, introduced predators, climate change, road salt, and calcium decline. Norman has concentrated on effects on the animal plankton, which he calls the little living lawnmowers in our lakes. He has co-authored over 200 scientific articles, a body of work that has garnered over 10,000 scholarly citations, provincial and national awards for research at excellence, academic fellowships in Europe and Australia, and in 2012, an induction into the Academy of Science of the Royal Society of Canada. Please welcome Dr. Norman Yan. Hello, everyone, <clears throat> and uh, thank you for registering for this series, which I'm sure you will enjoy as much as I will. Uh, Jordan, are we okay? Can everyone see the slides and hear me? Norman, it looks great, and you are good to go. Okay, thank you. Well, my job as the first speaker in this series is really to set the stage, and I'll do that by reflecting on half a century of work uh, on Ontario Lakes, 
uh, from a Western ecological science tradition, because that's what I was trained in. But I'll end up focusing, yes, things, but mainly on the failings and the weaknesses I have slowly come to see in the work and the approach to the work over the years. And then I ask, what might some of the sages of the ages, Hillel, Hiawatha, and Hippocrates, have thought about Western ecological science? So. What, are, what have I actually done for the last 50 years? So I spent 50 years trying to figure out how serious uh, the damage was from uh, chemical pollution that came from the atmosphere, for example, acid rain and, and metal pollution from smelters, such as the one shown on the left, and other chemicals such as road salt and calcium decline, as John mentioned, and even uh, uh, excessive use or, uh, or supply of phosphorus that might have come from shoreline development. I didn't limit myself to chemical pollutants though. I was also very interested in um, non-native and native species introductions, the spiny water flea, the non-native one and bass, the native one and how they might influence our lakes. And then I did a, um, a side trip to parasites for a couple of years and almost ended up devoting my career to the study of parasites on plankton of all things. I also included work on the physics of lakes, uh, the effects of climate change and ozone depletion. So what I'm gonna talk about today uh, comes from uh, those that 50 year of work on ways that we messed up the chemistry, the biology and the physics of our lakes. These six points on this slide is, is how I'm gonna organize the talk. And I'm gonna start really by talking about how wonderful the natural world is um, to get us going. So the natural world is wonderful, but for lakes, uh, it's mostly invisible to us, of course, because while we're full of water and came from water and couldn't survive without water, we don't live in the lakes. We, uh, we see it under the keel of our canoe as we're paddling across it. Most of you will recognize these animals, the birds and the fish and the crayfish and the snails that live in lakes or the weeds that might tangle our paddle. Uh, you may not recognize the uh, this beautiful long-tailed mayfly, unless it does this. So here's the emergence of mayflies from a lake in Europe. And if you happen to be going through North Bay when the mayflies emerge from Lake Nipissing, you might have seen something similar. This gives a hint to us about how abundant the life in lakes really is. <clears throat> uh, but it's not just the mayflies that are abundant. Uh, uh, water is, every drop of water is actually full of millions of living things. If we actually think about the range of, of sizes of creatures on earth, it's quite a remarkable range. The biggest creatures on earth are undoubtedly the fungi, which can be square kilometers um, in size, 10 times bigger than the largest trees, which are 10 times bigger than the largest whales. And then we get to you and me, born at just under a meter, dying at just over a meter. It, well, sorry, if we were just over a meter, we'd join the Toronto Raptors, uh, probably just under uh, two meters in size. But we're still enormous by comparison to the range of creatures in the world. 10 times smaller than us are most birds, 10 times smaller than them, most butterflies, a thousand times smaller than us, the water fleas that I devoted much of my life to studying. But there are creatures or living things in lakes that are a thousand times smaller than the water fleas. This is kind of the limit of what we can actually see. Um, the reason this really matters here is the smaller the creatures tend to be, um, so here's a range in lakes from fish right down to viruses, the more biodiverse they tend to be. So we might have millions of species of viruses and bacteria in lakes, but only 10 or 20 species of fish, for example. And the size of the organisms actually correlates with their abundance. There certainly aren't more than one fish per liter of lake water, but at the other extreme, there are tens of billions of viruses per liter of lake water. So um, the vast majority of, cre of things that, that live in lakes, the life in lakes are too small to see and the vast majority of the biodiversity is actually invisible to us, but very important. Um, I just want to introduce you to a water flea. Um, if Rick McGraw is on the call, Rick, this is for you. Here's a little Daphnia here on the right. 
she is one millimeter long. Um, she's a she. Uh, they generally uh, have given up on men as a waste of time, except for the late fall. <clears throat> when a grandmother will decide that some of her grandchildren will actually be men. Uh, Linda Lynn, the artist, was so fascinated by that concept that a grandmother, Daphne, here shown in lavender, would make a decision about the gender of her grandchildren that she used that as the basis of a painting. But just now remember, this animal is a millimeter long. I'll show you some of her parts. She's got an eye that sees better than us, <clears throat> connected to her brain. She has these exquisite filtering combs that are cleaning the lake of algae and other scrapers that scrape the algae off the filtering combs to her midline where, where uh, the algae are shredded by these teeth and then crushed by this little plate. And they go up into this muscular esophagus and the entire volume of Lake Muskoka is filtered by these little Daphnia and her sisters and cousins. Typically uh, every week to two weeks all summer, they keep our legs clean. So they're small, almost invisible, but uh, fully recognized multicellular animals that behave and reproduce and uh, swim the equivalent of a marathon every day. Um, and they're, even though in they're invisible to us, they're important to our survival. Uh, in a TED talk I recently watched by Tom Zimmerman, he called plankton our ultimate elders. And by that he meant that uh, we'd be blind, stupid, hungry, and dead without plankton. And they produce all the oxygen that allowed all other life on Earth to develop. So here's just some of the things that, these, that you can read that these plankton do for us. They produce half the oxygen, half the sugar, uh, most of the omega-3 fatty acids that keep our brains healthy. Some of the algae, they fix atmospheric nitrogen, <clears throat> they keep our legs clean. And the further we are divorced from marine or water-based diets, the unhealthier we become. So the first lesson in this reflection is that the tiny things that are invisible to us uh, that live in lakes are important to our survival and essentially render lake water virtually alive. If there's a million living things per drop of water, uh, it's hard not to say that that lake water is in some way alive. But we have damaged these living ecosystems all around the world. I'll just show a few examples of that. Um, <clears throat> we have changed the physics, the chemistry, and the biology of the Earth by our actions. This image of the night sky from space shows that we've even changed the appearance of the night in large parts of the developed world and around shorelines elsewhere in the undeveloped parts of the world. Um, these changes in the night sky are not invisible to animals. I have a um, Marianne Moore in Boston who's actually studied visual pigments of water fleas and has shown that they've evolved now to have a new photopigment that's sensitive to the frequency of the of lights from soda vapor street lights at night. Um, it doesn't look like most of Canada is invisible. Here's the great lake, the Lake Michigan right there. So we're just above the lighted part on this screen <clears throat> in this image. We have changed the physics of the entire world, as you know. Here are temperatures of the land and the ocean. This graph is six or seven years old, but the main point I want to make is that the far northern regions uh, are heating up enormously, and northern Russia even more than northern Canada. There are not every place in the world is getting warmer, but the uh, far north certainly is across Europe and Western Canada. So we're changing the very physics of the, of the atmosphere, and that has changed the physics of water. So Sapna Sharma uh, has led an international team that's gathered water temperatures from around the world uh, since 1985. And the, the redder the dot, uh, the more that lake has warmed since 1985. So a few lakes have got colder. There's a few that are blue, but the vast majority have got warmer and typically warming by a degree uh, or even maybe a little more than a degree centigrade per decade, which is <clears throat> a lot of warming. So the physics of the world is changing. We've also changed the chemistry of the world with pollutants and other chemicals. Here's just one example. 
uh, the percent of the world's population, this is people now, that are at risk of lead poisoning. And the only places in the world that I can spot on this map, here's Finland, for example, that is um, less than 5% of the population is threatened. But Canada, a significant percentage, 10 to 19%. Historically, this was a legacy of lead and gasoline, but these days it's, of course, lead in pipes, uh, lead in paint that children might uh, eat. So all over the world, we have added chemicals to that might affect ourselves. And because they affect us, um, they're in our drinking water supplies and in our wastewater streams. So they're potentially affecting the environment as well. So we're affecting the physics <clears throat> and the chemistry, but we're also changing the biology of the world. <clears throat> One of the great discoveries of the ages of discovery in Darwin's days was the unique flora and fauna of different continental regions. So the flora and fauna of Australia and <clears throat> South Africa and Central America, even though they're on the roughly the same latitude, were very different. We're changing that. This quite remarkable graph was put together by Lloyds of London, the insurers, to look at uh, <clears throat> annual trips across the ocean, 17,000 trips by ships. Um, <clears throat> and you can't even see the Great Lakes um, so many ships uh, are arriving there, mainly from the Baltic and Europe. These are not individual trips. Notice that the brighter the yellow, this is more than 5,000 trips a year. So <clears throat> from China uh, or Asia across the ocean through Panama and into the Great Lakes is quite a common route. And every one of these ships is carrying creatures either on deck or in its ballast water. So we have fiddled. Um, with thousands of years of geographic isolation of species around the world. We've changed the biology, the physics, and the chemistry of the world. So the implication of that, to me, as a community ecologist, is to realize that there are no truly pristine ecosystems left. Um, <clears throat> the world isn't an untrammeled paradise, like this image on the left. And it's not a radioactive hell, like this image on the right. It's somewhere in between. Um, but uh, to pretend that we can go somewhere and study nature the way it would have been uh, a thousand years ago is probably not possible. OK. That being the case, I've slowly come to realize that my professors, who are trained in Western science as community ecologists, which is the discipline that I chose and love, misled me about what ecologists can know. And I think this is of fundamental importance and is probably the most complicated part of the talk. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna spend a little time dwelling on that because it, that's my dog, <laughs> Ollie, who wants to know why I'm not downstairs with him. So I'm, Sandy's gonna go down and see what she can do. <clears throat> I apologize about that. So if you Google what ecology is, you'll get a definition something like this. Uh, that ecology is a discipline whose core goal is to understand the distribution and abundance of living things and, uh, and the physical environment. Uh, <clears throat> so the unstated assumption here is that there first is such a thing as a non-living physical environment. Well, I'm not any longer sure that that's true. If every drop of lake water has a million living things in it, where exactly is the non-living physical environment that we're supposed to be able to study that's separate from the organisms? I think this is the first <clears throat> realization that ecologists have to make, especially if they're studying water, but I suspect it's also true of terrestrial landscapes. Perhaps more importantly, <clears throat> the gauge of success of science is predictive accuracy. Uh, for example, the law of gravity or the theory of gravity would suggest that if you open your window and jump out, you're going to fall to the earth. And I can't imagine a situation <clears throat> where that prediction that if you jump out the window, you'll fall would fail. That's sort of typical in a way of what science ultimately, Western science ultimately hopes to do, that we can make a prediction uh, 
in the case of ecology, about the distribution and abundance of species, um, that is accurate. Uh, and I would suggest that that's probably not possible. And let me explain why. Here's a map of Muskoka with the lakes shown in light blue. There are 1,600 of them. Everyone differs in origin, in age, in connections, in depth, in fetch, in chemistry, in development. <clears throat> and all of those different features affect the life in those lakes. If we want to make a prediction about a particular lake, <clears throat> we'd have to take all those factors into account. Um, it's not just the hydrology and the physics that varies. The life in these lakes varies enormously. And there are, as I said, thousands of species in each lake. And many of them interact with each other. And so if we want to make a prediction about the abundance of species down the road, we might have to know something about those interactions. Well, in a lake called Little Rock Lake in Wisconsin, <clears throat> there was one attempt made to figure out the number of interactions between these fish and these insects and these animal plankton and these groups of algae, 92 different groups. They studied it for years in this one small lake and determined 997 linkages. And all those little green lines are the linkages. Uh, the problem is, there aren't 92 species in a lake. There's probably a thousand. So they probably underestimated the number of linkages by orders of magnitude. And if we want to predict the abundance of species in lakes, that's a problem, if that's our goal. Um, I'm going to bring it back to home to the work I did at the Dorset Environmental Science Center over many years. <clears throat> so over in, in eight lakes um, that were studied for many years, um, we counted animal plankton in 1,865 samples from eight lakes, and we got a total of 78 species. Here's the 78 down here, 78 species of animals that were cousins of the little Daphnia uh, that I showed you earlier. <clears throat> the problem for me is that most of them are rare. Only five of the species, these first five, were found in more than 1,000 samples. 42% um, of the species were found, these here, were found in less than 10 of the almost 2,000 samples. And almost 20% of the species, these ones here, were found only once. So the vast majority of the species were actually rare. So being able to predict the abundance uh, of these species and the composition is very challenging when the species are so rare that you rarely actually encounter them. And in addition to the physics and the species interactions uh, mattering, just like all other animals, animal plankton suffer from predators and parasites. This wonderful image of a glass, it's called a glass worm or um, a phantom midge. Uh, look at these teeth here. So this is the mandible that grabs onto a Daphnia and pierces it and, and allows it to be eaten. This animal is about a centimeter long. The Daphnia is about a millimeter long. I have one colleague at the University of Buffalo who spent 35 years just studying the interaction of this predator with this prey. And after 30 years of work, he's got, he thinks, a handle on how it works a good part of the time. We're a long way from understanding the interaction of thousands of species in lakes. And we're missing whole categories of stressors. Here's a Daphnia that's full of a fungal parasite. Almost nothing is known about the effects of parasites on these animals, except that it's probably profound. <clears throat> it's actually why I kind of devoted a year to it, because I was very fascinated by studying a fundamental process um, like parasitism, unlike competition and predation that have rarely been studied. So there are a great many stressors. I've listed them here. Um, in Muskoka, over the 25 or 30 years that I worked on animal plankton, I found all these things mattered. Um, glacial history, the shape and depth of reformatory of lakes, the physics of lakes, the chemistry, phosphorus, acidity, calcium salt metals. There was all kinds of things that affected animal plankton. Um, and it varied from lake to lake and place to place and time to time. 
Um, and if that wasn't complicated enough, the vast majority of species on Earth are still not known. So we don't even know what it is that, you know, uh, what composition and, and what species mix we ultimately are trying to predict. So this is why I think my professors misled me in a way as a community ecologist, that because the goal of predicting the long-term abundance of species in any meaningful way across a landscape is actually not possible. There's too many species to track. They interact in too many ways. They're affected by everything. A lot of the species are actually rare, but rare species may occasionally become important. Um, <clears throat> so I was given a goal that I can't reach as a Western scientist, an ecologist, and I believe we need to <clears throat> change our goal uh, and find ways to protect the environment to, that do not depend on predicting community composition, which is what kind of I devoted much of my life to. So how do we move forward <clears throat> when all these situations are true? When all legs differ, all time and space scales matter, there are hundreds of known species, many undescribed species, most are invisible, but still may be important, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I scratch my head, but I think it's time to consult the stage, the sages. So Hillel, the elder, who lived in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, was the spiritual leader of the Jews for about 40 years, uh, <clears throat> from the age of 40 to 80. And he was the head of an amazing institution called the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like a mix of a Supreme Court and a parliament. And he passed many edicts, uh, which uh, Jewish scholars know about, but there were two famous quotes that he uh, made that have reverberated through time. The first is illustrated in this sculpture here, where Hillel is instructing um, a non-Jew, a Gentile, who is standing on one foot. Um, the story is that this Gentile came to Hillel and said, I'm very interested in Judaism. I'm interested in the five books of Moses, the Torah, which we now call the Old Testament, <clears throat> but I don't have time to really study it. So while I'm standing here on one foot, can you teach me the Torah? the lessons of the Old Testament. And Hillel said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. And the Gentile said, that's it? And Hillel apparently said, well, all the rest is commentary, but it is worth studying. But that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow, is the essential lesson. It was the first probably recorded statement of the golden rule. Uh, from an environmental standpoint, think about what that implies for NIMBY. If uh, cutting down this forest next to you would be hateful, perhaps you shouldn't be doing it beside somebody else. The other thing he's famous for is this series of three questions. If I'm not for, my, for me, who will be for me? And being only for me when I'm I, and if not now, when? Bob Ray, our former uh, NDP and then liberal leader, um, so like these three questions, he thought of them as the roots of philosophy that the book he wrote about his political career was called The Three Questions. Um, <clears throat> so you first must lead your life in such a way that you can look after yourself philosophically, economically, practically. But the reason you're doing that is not for self-interest. You're doing it so you can look after your community and I might add your environment. And there's no time like the present. The second sage um, I'm hoping we might hear more about from Sue or um, Henry down the road is Hiawatha, uh, an Onondaga warrior known for uniting the five nations along with a great um, peacemaker. And that this is the illustration of Hiawatha meeting the great peacemaker. And way, you know, 500 years ago, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk were united by the work apocryphally of Hiawatha and the great peacemaker into a political confederacy that was then joined by the Tuscarora a few hundred years later to form the, the Six Nations. Uh, why does this matter? Well, when the fathers of the American um, constitution, there were apparently no mothers, uh, we're looking for a model to follow. There was nothing in Europe at the time that they wanted to follow, but they adopted the 
the great law of peace of the Iroquois Confederacy as a model for the American Declaration of Independence. It's not widely known and has only recently been recognized by the American government. So democracy uh, as a federation uh, with local and national responsibilities was an idea that came <clears throat> from the First Nations um, 500 years ago and uh, I believe has real implications for how we might look after the environment today. And I'll come to that later. Finally, um, Hippocrates the medic uh, 2,500 years ago, most people know of the Hippocratic Oath. Um, the original version has been rewritten several times. Um, Dr. Louis Lasagna, who was the Dean of Medicine at Tufts wrote a version in 1964 that I'm quoting here. And I just think, um, uh, I'm not quoting it, I'm praising it and putting it in terms uh, without changing the, in the intent that I, I think is more meaningful to the discussion today. Um, respect the knowledge of your elders. Do what is needed, no more, no less. There is an art and science and medicine and emotions and feelings matter. This is not something that Western ecologists were taught in my day. It was just a science. Emotions and feelings did not matter. And it certainly wasn't thought of as an art. Um, humility is a core value of practice as knowledge is incomplete, absolutely. Individual knowledge is incomplete, so collaborate with others, absolutely. Now you are caring for a family, not just a person, and you have responsibility for all your fellows, not just your patient. To me, this means you have responsibilities potentially for the whole watershed, depending on how you wanna define your fellows. Prevention is preferable to cures. We always say that, but it's a very difficult sell in our current political culture. So um, I think we can learn a lot from these sages about caring for the natural world. Um, I focused on generating natural science knowledge. I did not focus at all on generating the will to use that knowledge. The latter is more complex in origin, uh, more complex probably to organize, but is clearly um, required. And Hippocrates has made that clear as has Hillel. Um, Hiawatha, I believe has made it clear that um, <clears throat> we should be supporting democracies, a governance model uh, in which knowledge and will can be generated and flow. Um, Hillel's golden rule, uh, not NIMBY, can certainly be applied to the environment. Um, and then the rest of these, uh, which come from uh, Lasagna's version of the Hippocratic Oath, I love and they make a lot of sense to me. Okay, so how do we use that? First thing to realize is let's be clear about what the weaknesses, I've already pointed out some of them. Western ecological science are as the main bulwark of environmental uh, stability. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, Professor Chiblo, Susan, who's talking next week, um, uh, commented in her little promotional video that there's a large literature on traditional ecological knowledge. And my God, that's true. Um, I, I searched that, or a bunch of it anyway, for as I prepared for this webinar series. One of the papers that I found that I most loved was called this one. It's in part because of the first author's name. When your last name is Yan, like mine, you have to uh, really respect someone whose last name is Kealii Kana Keo Leo Hai Liani. I apologize to any Hawaiian for butchering that name. Um, but this paper astounded me. The entire first page was not anything you would ever see in a typical scientific article. It was the authors sitting on a hilltop staring over the ocean in Hawaii and just reflecting on what they were seeing and thanking the dolphins and the waves and the hillside. And my initial thought was, what is this doing in a scientific paper? But I came to realize they were setting the mood, the mood, the emotion, the will in which you should be reading their work. It was really a, a revelation for me that that kind of introduction could be in a scientific article. Now, from that article, <clears throat> the authors listed a number of strengths of Western science, and they're listed here, and I'm not gonna read them to you because I agree with all of them and they're pretty straightforward. But they went on to talk about limitations of Western science. Uh, and these are limitations that I hope we can address 
to some extent in the rest of this webinar series, that nature is typically treated as only having commodity value or resource value. And that means if you fill in a lake here, but create another lake somewhere else, a lake is a lake, and so that should be okay. Nature in Western tradition, except of late in a few places, is not given any inherent rights. Instead, when I've talked to a lawyer about this, he said, it makes no sense to give nature rights because humans have responsibilities to look after nature. We have rights and responsibilities, but I would argue that the human responsibility in the Western tradition to protect nature has not worked very well. Uh, we've done a lot of damage to nature. We allow pollution to a point. That's the whole, we legislate this much pollution is allowed and we trust that we can define that point. But I would say we often fail and I'll show an example of that. Even if we know what to do, we rarely act in time. <clears throat> Prevention does not sell well um, in the West. Uh, it doesn't sell West politically. Uh, the argument will be you spent money and nothing happened. It was a waste of money, right? So you, it's hard to justify politically that prevention makes sense unless it's eliminating some pollutant that's caused damage before that's well understood. So we build sewage treatment plants now because we did learn that letting our sewage go untreated into waters was a bad thing. Um, we plan short-term uh, quarterly reports, election cycles, but nature has its own timeframes. Lakes typically flush in months to years to decades, and that's the time frame over which lakes change. <clears throat> we often assume a little more pollution can't be so bad. We assume linear cause-effect linkages, and we know those are often false. Uh, at some point, you'll hit a cliff and fall over the edge, and that won't be good. We work in silos. This is one area where I think Western science and traditional ecological knowledge really differ and where we could really learn a lot from a traditional ecological knowledge. Um, environmental scientists, lawyers, engineers, policy analysts, com uh, communicators go to different schools, have different profs, never take the same courses, work in different offices, barely talk to each other. In the 25 years I worked at the Ministry of the Environment, I talked to a policy analyst once. So this is very serious that, that we are so siloed in our approach to looking after the environment in the, in the West. And the last point I'll make about a limitation is that you know, expertise is, of course, wonderful and valuable, um, especially if you're working at astronomical scales or at molecular scales in rocket science and vaccine development. Uh, but it works less well um, at human scales where we're trying to set agendas about how to look after nature. Um, it's not just the experts that should have a say about looking after the environment. Okay, let me move on to what we should do about this. Um, so I have four or five recommendations I would make that are in part inspired by um, Hillel, Hiawatha, and Hippocrates, but not all. Um, this is a photograph of the landing at Harp Lake, east of Huntsville, here in Muskoka, east on Highway 60. Crews from uh, the uh, Dorset Environmental Science Center have used, are here every week pretty well. There are hundreds of papers have been written on this lake. I consider this lake a national treasure in terms of the insights it's given us about what can go wrong with lakes. In the early 70s, <clears throat> work began on this lake just to figure out how many cottages we can safely put around the lake. Um, but since then, crews from the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks and various universities have kept going there and we keep on learning more. And the effects of acid rain, where mercury comes from, um, the effects of the spiny water flea on food webs. People from all over Europe came to Harp Lake to look at this lake where so much was learned about the spiny water flea. The effects of sulfur dioxide emission reductions, interactions of drought and acid rain, effects of calcium decline, road salt, and climate change. <clears throat> Only the first of these was initially planned. Everything else emerged because careful, thoughtful people were looking at long-term data. So maintaining these long-term data sets is critical. And the second point I wanna make is to maintain hope. Hippocrates said emotions matter. 
um, hope is the is the value that leads to the generation of will. There's lots of reasons to be hopeful. And I'll give two examples. This is the King's Way going east out of Sudbury towards North Bay and what it looked like in 1960. Uh, the rocks blackened by fires and, and sulfur dioxide emissions, no trees. Um, just look at this little brick house right here. You can still see a little bit of that brick house right here in this photograph taken 30 years later from the same place. Here's this black rock. That's the rock there. <clears throat> Things have got a lot better in Sudbury. 98% emission reductions, millions of trees planted. There is reason to be hopeful. Now here's a data set that's rarely been looked at. Um, a pH of six is considered uh, a threshold below which damage starts happening in lakes to all kinds of biota. The Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks has been sampling four lakes with a pH below six since the 1970s. Um, the lakes are Chubb, Crossone, Plastic and Heaney. Emissions started to be reduced in the 80s and the 90s. Things started changing. Uh, every year, crews grow to these lakes once every fortnight or once a month. And by 2019, finally, with that data point right there, all four lakes now have a pH above six. There's reason to be hopeful, but it takes patience. Recovery can happen if you do the right thing uh, and step back and let nature do its thing. Um, the next a bit of advice I would have is to make sure if you're allowing a certain amount of pollution, which we do now, to make sure that the targets are relevant to the real world, not the benchtop. Here's an example. This is how the federal government set the target for road salt or chloride at this level, 120 milligrams per liter. They took all kinds of toxicological studies on fish and amphibians and invertebrates and algae, 28 different species. They identified the chloride level at which damage occurred. They put them on a graph. It's called the Species Sensitivity Distribution, SSD. And then they said, okay, let's protect 95% of the species. We, you know, we're, we're a little worried that the mollusks are more sensitive, um, but let's set a target as long as the chloride is over 120, uh, less than 120 milligrams per liter, road salt should not be a problem. And then scientists went out to the real world and <clears throat> took real water and added salt and discovered that this wouldn't work. Then in the real world, um, it, if you let the chloride level rise above 10 milligrams per liter, 10 times lower than the national standard, damage would occur to the entire community. So my fourth bit of advice is to never let things happen in the real world that are beyond the evolutionary experience of the living creatures that are from that area. So it's very dangerous to let non-native species such as zebra mussels or the spiny water flea in that have very different operational modes than anything that currently lives there. If your lakes have never hit 30 degrees, you know that there are probably gonna be problems if you let them hit 30 degrees and we're getting very close. The same with levels of calcium and road salt and acidity. And certainly things like microplastics and, and various chemicals, herbicides, hormones, pharmaceuticals, that are beyond the evolutionary experience of life, you should be very careful introducing those into the natural world. Now, um, all three sages felt you have to reach out to the public. So here's just an example of one of four or five meetings we had with many members of the public when we were starting our ASH project. This is a human scale project to fix the forest from uh, half a century of acid rain that leached calcium out of the soil. And we wanted, because we reached out to the public and asked what they thought was worth doing, we've ended up with over a thousand people participating in this project. I wanna to return to Hiawatha and what he might've had to say about the role of peace and democracy and freedom in protecting the environment. And I'll say this is the most speculative part of the talk and it's kind of how I'm gonna end the talk. Um, <clears throat> Back in 2008, a gentleman by the name of Seymour Gard, who had just retired as a public health professional in the United States, wrote a book called Where We Stand, a surprising look at the real state of our planet. And 
when I read this book, I was kind of upset because it was actually a topic that I was thinking about writing about. Um, <clears throat> signs of hope uh, uh, from the environmental movement, if you want. And what he showed here, for example, is that there is a link between how free a country is. Every uh, symbol here is a measure of the freedom of a nation gathered by freedomhouse.org, an NGO in the United States, and the infant mortality rate of that nation taken from the World Health Organization. And even after correcting for um, income differences, there was this enormous trend in that democracies had lower rates of infant mortality than autocracies. And his explanation for that was in a free country where you can vote the leaders out. If they pass rules that are gonna kill your children, they're gonna kick the bums out. Now I was interested in this and wondered if the same might be true for not just infant mortality, but environmental performance of nations. So <clears throat> delightfully, a group of four organizations headed by the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, every couple of years, assemble the inf information on the environmental performance of nations. And the red ones are not doing well, the green ones are doing very well. It won't surprise you that Iceland up here has great environmental performance. Norway has great performance. There is Costa Rica, great environmental performance. So my wife Sandy and I sat down on a Sunday and we built a spreadsheet in which we merged the environmental performance index values with freedomhouse.org's data on freedom or democracy. Now this data is a little bit old. It was, I did this a couple of years ago, but I think it's still quite interesting. Uh, freedom House link divided nations into free, partially free or not free. And when you looked at the environmental performance, there was an enormous and very significant difference that the free countries had better environmental performance than the partly free ones. And that was a little better again than the not free. But the big change was going from free to partially free. I'd be very interested in knowing from more recent data what Freedom House has said about what's happening in the United States. You know, are they moving from free to partially free? But this suggests to me a very simple analysis that Hiawatha's insights about peace and order and democratic federalism uh, might actually apply to environmental performance. And because of this, when I was, I was asked recently, what's the single most important thing to do to protect the environment? And my answer was keep democracy functioning, keep a free press, keep free high level education. And if you can do that, um, chances are the environment will be in good shape. So, um, I'm just about done. So let me conclude with two slides. Um, I think I've identified a number of weaknesses in Western scientific approach to protecting nature. We actually didn't do too bad a job correcting problems after we let them happen, but we sure did a bad job preventing problems from happening in the first place. There may be other approaches uh, that we could have taken that might have allowed us to protect nature better in the long term. Professor Chiblo noted there's a large literature on this, and she is certainly correct, and she'll know that literature vastly better than me. Um, and we'll hear about this, I hope, over the next four webinars. So if you will take this as an introductory talk to this webinar series, I invite you to register for the next four series, next four webinars in the series, next week by Professor Chiblo, who will talk about um, uh, water knowledge. Then we'll move to two non-Indigenous uh, scholars, uh, David and Neil, uh, who will talk about their experience <clears throat> uh, in Neil's case, case studies with traditional knowledge in Western science science, working with the Inuit in the Arctic, and in David's case, working with um, uh, six different indigenous councils, I believe in Northern Ontario, working on climate change. And then I'll be delighted that the International Joint Commissioner, Com uh, Commissioner Henry Lickers will, will wrap up our webinar series. <clears throat> 
um, in four weeks with a topic on the many worlds of knowledge. I thank you again uh, for listening to this introductory webinar. I hope it set the stage by identifying what I see as some of the strengths, but also the weaknesses of relying solely on a Western ecological perspective as a bulwark for environmental protection. You can learn a lot, but I don't think it's enough on its own. I thank you again for listening, and I'd be happy to accept any questions you might have. Norman, your presentation was very inspiring and informative on how we can take a broader and new approach to sustainability. Your presentation has also sparked a number of questions from our audience. So now we're gonna to move to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Our first question is, why is prevention really handled badly by Western science? And might traditional knowledge approaches be superior to Western science for preventing damage? Well, that's quite a question. So <clears throat> my response to that is as follows. Um, it's a bit political and it's a bit pro, it's a bit related to value systems. I, my sense, and I think we'll hear more about this in the next four weeks, is that traditional ecological knowledge focuses more on the real value of a place, uh, its historical significance for the people, its significance for um, and the people that will come seven generations down the, down the road and all the creatures that live there. So there's more inherent value assigned to a particular place in a, a traditional ecological system than in Western science. I don't think First Nations peoples, and this is just, you know, we'll hear more of this from Henry and Sue, would be happy with the notion, okay, we can fill this lake in here as long as we can create another lake somewhere else. Um, uh, if you've been living in one place for thousands of years and your ancestors are there um, and you feel your spirit is there, then you might work harder to prevent damage to that place rather than looking to see how much pollution you can get away with before there's transformative damage. The other issue is kind of political. This is going back to the Western ecological model that prevention is kind of a hard sell politically. Um, unless something has already been damaged badly once, uh, because the opposition parties can say, why did you spend that billion dollars building those sewage plants when we have no evidence you know, that sewage is a problem? Now for sewage, we know that would not be a good argument because we saw the damage, but for pharmaceuticals or hormones or microplastics or other sorts of novel damage for which we haven't yet proven that damage, it might be harder to justify spending the money to prevent. Um, and it might be more politically sellable to restore after the damage was done. Does that make any sense? Okay. Sure does. So next question is, is, do you see opportunities to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge approach and practice into the work you do with the Friends of Muskoka Watershed? that could include the ASH program or other initiatives that you're currently working on? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, and the answer is yes, we, we've made the attempt uh, through West Wind uh, Forest Stewardship. So West Wind is a not-for-profit organization that manages the Crown Forest, and they have very strong connections with a number of First Nations communities in the area. And, um, First Nations communities have sugar bushes, and, um, and we've done quite a bit of work on sugar bushes. And so we did submit a grant application, which was unfortunately not successful, um, uh, to use ASH as a nature-based solution to climate change. And one of the partners in that would have been, uh, if we had been successful, three First Nations communities. So I absolutely think it makes sense um, we don't at the moment have a First Nations member on our board. Uh, that's another possibility for us. So yes, I think there are real possibilities. I think given that our mission of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed is to protect Muskoka Watersheds kind of forever, um, it seems to me that core mission is uh, not out of sync with what First Nations peoples might also want. Uh, for Muskoka, but it's not up to me to say what First Nations peoples want. I'm looking to learn uh, 
what that is over the next uh, month, or at least begin to learn uh, by listening carefully with an open mind and an open heart. Okay. So of all the stressors of the lakes you've worked on, which were the worst and longest lasting? Uh, okay. So the longest lasting would be the ones that made permanent irrevocable changes. Um, so for example, the arrival of the spiny water flea, a self-replicating threat, a uh, predator from Europe, um, you know, once you have a new species in a lake, like a zebra mussel or a spiny water flea, um, that kind of changes things forever. So in a way, if those invading species are truly damaging, like zebra mussels are, I would say they're probably the worst. Now, fortunately, we don't have zebra mussels in Muskoka lakes, and the lakes are too soft, they can't live here. Um, the other uh, stressors that would have been worse are ones that actually end up permanently uh, driving species to extinction. So if you've had a stressor that actually renders a species extinct in a lake, uh, that actually would be something very serious. So the amazing thing to me is when I go to say, there are lakes in Sudbury that were a thousand times more acidic than they should have been and species were driven to extinction locally. We lost about two thirds of the animal plankton species in those lakes, but they've come back. You know, So the regional, what's called the meta community, there are connections between lakes. Moose, you know, <laughs> fish carry plankton from lake to lake. People carry plankton from lake to lake in their boats. And so um, as long as you can get the habitat back uh, in a lake, and, uh, and the damage is kind of localized regionally, you should be able to recover. Perfect. Are there ways traditional ecological knowledge can be incorporated into large scale environmental initiatives like the integrated watershed management system? Uh, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the answer to that is yes, but I would rather wait for Sue or Henry or Neil or um, David to answer that question because they are the ones that have more experience than me. Uh, I, I have no experience in that at all, but it would be, I would find it incredible if the answer to that question was not yes. We'll save that question for them. Yeah. So what small actions can we take in our local communities to help? Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, it depends on the stressor we're concerned about. So for climate change, um, buy, make sure your next car is an electric car. Uh, make sure your next furnace is um, a heat pump, uh, if you can. Um, uh, and then think about where you throw things. Um, think about your waste. There's no a way to throw anything to anymore. Anything you end up throwing, away in the garbage is going to end up uh, in the environment at some point. We've learned that. So think about, um, oh, okay, I'll go back here. So the most widespread problem we have for lakes is calcium decline, believe it or not. So get involved in the Ash Muskoka project um, if you can. The second most widespread problem I'm going to say is road salt. So think carefully about um, how you salt around your property. If you have coarse salt uh, that is crunching under your feet on dry pavement, sweep it up. You've added too much salt, more than's needed. The next time there's a melt, all that salt is going to end up in the lake. There's currently 15,000 tons of excess road salt in Lake Muskoka that's doing damage. We don't want it there. So that's a couple of things. Perfect. So I've got a, a question from a resident who lives on Skeleton Lake, lake and have been there for over 70 years and they've noticed the shelled creatures have gone from the lake. Should he be dumping fireplace ash into the lake? So there's the corporate answer, the regulatory answer, and then my answer. <laughs> uh, the first thing he should um, do is ask the Dorset Environmental Science Center what the calcium level in the lake is. If the calcium level in the lake is still over two or three milligrams per liter, um, then chances are 
the loss of the shelled creatures may not actually have been caused by calcium decline. But calcium levels have fallen by 25 to 30 or 40 percent in most lakes in Muskoka. So this resident could easily be seeing something real. The Ministry of the Environment still treats wood ash as a potentially hazardous waste. So I can't recommend throwing it directly in the lake. But I will tell you that the people on Brandy Lake uh, <clears throat> throw all their firewood ashes in the cul-de-sac in the winter. And they've been doing that for decades, apparently. They told me at one meeting. So all of that wood ash um, uh, uh, is, is a fertilizer and it'll end, up, it'll end up in the water. And that's one of the reasons why calcium levels in Lake Muskoka have not fallen. So um, I would rather that resident on Brandy Lake uh, bring, uh, signs up to the Ash Muskoka program uh, the Ash Muskoka website that actually was, I think, marketed uh, in your looping videos and help us learn um, what the best thing we can do with wood ash is to get calcium levels in our watersheds back up where they would have been before acid rain. Okay. Why is prevention really handled badly by Western science and might traditional knowledge approaches be superior to Western science for preventing damage? So again, that's a question I love could be asked each week, especially of, of Dr. Lickers and Professor Chiblo. My sense is because their uh, traditional ecological knowledge has a less siloed approach uh, than Western ecological knowledge, and that there's more of a focus on protection as opposed to allowing a little bit of pollution, but not too much. Um, and there's and the landscape itself, the watersheds, are given more inherent value um, as opposed to just commodity value or resource value. That there's a chance, there's a good chance that traditional approaches might work better to uh, prevent damage uh, in the first place. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, this individual lives on a lake in the Missinabe area with extensive gold exploration. What can I do to project the lake? Is there a boundary zone that could accomplish this? So there's prospecting for gold around the lake. Um, um, well, it's hard to comment on that without knowing more of the specifics. If the prospecting, I mean, if this was the Brazilian Amazon where they prospect for gold with mercury in pans, I would say, for God's sake, stop doing that. So I'm assuming in this case that there are core samples being taken, the actual, and that are being uh, analyzed for their metal content, that alone should not be causing any damage to the lake. Um, but if there's ultimately an idea to propose a mine for the lake, then there's all kinds of processes that would kick in uh, to make sure that, um, uh, well, to make sure that any mining that would take place would not, well, there, I don't think it's possible to have a mine that doesn't damage damage the environment because you've got to do something with the tailings. Um, surface mines obviously do more damage or open pit mines than uh, uh, than deep mines, but hmm, I haven't answered that question well. Um, I invite that person to contact me directly, perhaps. Okay, so the next one's an easier one for you. If you had to address issues in Muskoka's watershed one at a time, which, which one would you tackle first? <laughs> it's kind of like a sales pitch for me. Um, so the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed believes in tackling the most severe widespread stressors that the government is not currently dealing with that the public can actually help resolve. And so that's why we chose calcium decline as the first issue to deal with because it affects half the lakes in Muskoka and probably all of the forests, even though it's not visible to us. When crayfish die in a lake, we don't necessarily see that the crayfish have died. But in most Muskoka lakes, if you had gone down and picked up rocks with your grandfather 50 years ago, you would have found a lot more crayfish then than you'd find now. And the reason for that is probably calcium decline. Okay. My next question just popped down on me. <laughs> this 
Okay, is there a way of determining when a lake has reached capacity for shoreline dwellings? <laughs> so the third uh, speaker in our webinar series is an international expert on that topic of lake capacity. So I think I'm gonna, you should defer that question to him, to Dr. Neil Hutchinson. Perfect. You're gonna be such a great moderator for the rest of these uh, <laughs> programs with all these great questions for you to, to ask. So I'm gonna throw a really easy one at you. And um, there's, we would like to know why you chose this, uh, this career. Um, okay, my life is a tale of two Maxes. Uh, Max Yan, my father, who was a chemist who brought home a microscope from the lab when I was a young man. And Max Island, the Belgian lumberjack who took me canoeing when I was 10 years old. And so I just fell in love with canoeing. And in fourth year university, I discovered that there was a profession called limnology, which was the study of lakes that would allow me to go canoeing for a living uh, and without having to be a voyageur. And so I ended up doing planning a master's project and a PhD project that would let me go canoeing all over Ontario. And amazingly, that got me work. So that's kind of, I took something that I loved to do, which was to go canoeing and found a way to turn it into a career. Perfect. So we're getting close to the end of our time and we just have time for a couple of more questions. So the next one is how do zooplankton protect our lakes and are they of value to us? Uh, okay, so um, the, short the short answer is yes and yes. And they protect our lakes by being the little living lawnmowers in our lakes. So there's about 10 to 100 little animal plankton in every liter of healthy lake water in our lakes. And each one of those Daphnia cleans about 10 to 30 milliliters of water free of algae every single day. So the entire volume, for example, of Lake Muskoka is filtered free of algae um, uh, every week or two. Uh, so several times a year, the entire volume of the lake is being filtered clean by the animal plankton. And meanwhile, so the animal plankton then grow um, and they're feeding the fish and they, uh, some of them produce wonderful omega-3 fatty acids that are then in our, um, that, are, that make the visual pigments in our eyes and form 10% of the lipid in our brain. So there is a direct relationship between the plankton of the world, the clarity of our lakes, um, the, the food for our fish, and, um, and that's kind of why uh, they're important. The other thing for me that was valuable is because people don't harvest them uh, for any other reason except for krill. So krill in the ocean are animal plankton, and they're now harvested directly. The whales don't like it. Uh, but that krill is used to make omega-3 fatty acid pharmaceuticals for people. It's incredibly healthy for the brain and your vision. Um, uh, but they also made good indicators of environmental condition It's because they react quickly to changes in, in stressors in the environment and they're not harvested directly. So if there's a big change in the animal plankton, uh, we can be pretty sure it wasn't caused directly by somebody out there with an enormous net harvesting them, unless there's a whale shark suddenly gets into your lake, and then it might have been the whale shark that, that filtered them all up. But um, uh, so it's for that mix of what they do to keep our legs clean and feed the fish, but also form useful indicators um, for us to assess environmental condition that they are of value to us. Perfect. Okay, so as we approach the 515 mark, we have time for one more question. And before I ask Norman the last question, I would like to thank everyone today for all the questions that they've posted in the Q&A section. And Norman, our last question for the afternoon is, can real environmental solutions be achieved within our present capital seeking and political voting system? <laughs> well, my answer, I would say yes. Uh, <clears throat> and that's in part because I'm just a bloody optimist, but it's also because when I look at my career, the kind of flow of my career, um, there were four issues that started the environmental movement in the 50s and 60s and 70s. The first reported death of the Great Lakes, acid rain, 
lead pollution and its effects on children, and DDT and its effect on songbirds. And we have more or less solved those four issues that started the environmental movement in our system. So as long as the people's voices can be heard, uh, we have um, a well-functioning democracy. Um, in other words, we have a good free press that can inform the public of what's going on properly and good education. Uh, then I believe it's possible. I think with climate change, we're at the point now that we were at with tobacco at one point and with acid rain in the 80s, where there's a big cultural change happening. And once the culture recognizes there's a huge problem um, and the parade for action starts, then the politicians will find their way to the front of that parade. They rarely will leave the parade, but they'll often join it once the public has started it. Great. So I'm going to turn it back over to John. Awesome. Thanks, Anne. And thanks, Norm, very much for your presentation. Uh, just someone actually posted in the, in the chat uh, or in the Q&A, actually, uh, the website that you can go to to look up uh, calcium levels in your own lake. So uh, please take a look at that website. It's uh, in the Q&A currently. Um, so that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you to our audience. We had over uh, 100, and I think our, we got to 140 at one point. So, uh, which is an awesome level of engagement. Um, as Norman already said, uh, you can register next week to hear Susan Shiblow discuss uh, Anishinaabek women and their unique relationship to uh, and responsibility for water, which can inform water governance. So thank you all for joining us and have a good evening.